Hello everyone. I should give you a little bit of background. Uh, Mahesh uh, finished his PhD in 1992 from Oxford University and did one of the best theses in terms of a book also later that came out on the importance of the tiger as a symbol for conservation in India and how um, the history of conservation has really been a long history which integrates politics, which integrates economics, which integrates India's idea as a developing economy in the position it wanted to take in the world. And what we think of as purely ecological of tiger numbers actually means something much more to us. It symbolizes who we are as a country. And that has also been Mahesh's trajectory. Um, he was already working as a journalist even before he started his PhD. After he finished his uh, PhD and came back to India and took up a position at Nehru Memorial Library. Uh, he was continuing to come on TV. I think many of you might have seen him as a very seasoned cephologist who looked at the history of electoral politics in India and therefore helped people interpret what we saw in terms of politics. And I think that that combination of understanding real political change and what are the compulsions that drive politics and Relating that to history and relating that to ecology. I think that's a very unusual combination. We certainly don't have anyone in India quite like him. We had planned to have this a uh, few months earlier, but as I said, we couldn't think of anyone better than Mahesh to launch this series. Mahesh has taught at Delhi University. He's now a professor at Ashoka University. He was a vice chancellor at Kriya. He's uh, spoken and uh, taught at Cornell and a number of distinguished universities in India and outside. Has edited a number of different volumes on conservation, looking at it from a broader perspective. And I think is one of the best speakers I know. So it's simply unsurpassed in his capacity to, to weave in very disparate threads, which are actually connected in ways that we don't understand. So without further ado, it's a privilege for me to invite Professor Mahesh Rangarajan to deliver this first talk in our Let's Talk Climate Change series. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Nagendra. I think that was an excellent introduction, though I do think you went overboard in introducing me. I have been compared to many things, but uh, this was the first time uh, Magic Carpet and Aladdin came to mind. Uh, I firstly want to acknowledge it's a great honor and privilege to be here at the Bangalore International Center, uh, not for the first, uh, hopefully not the last time with an audience as distinguished and serious as this one. Uh, both Azim Premji University and uh, Bangalore International Center should be complimented uh, for having uh, taken the initiative for this series on talking climate change. I really liked also the fact that we began with a very important point that climate change is about more than just climate change. Often in today's public debate, uh, the ones which happen outside the social media, we all love the social media, but it tends to reduce things to whether you're for or against something. So do you really think the climate is changing or not? Uh, are, are you a climate change denier or are you an alarmist? That would how it would get framed. But I think aside from that and away from that, there is a very important set of public debates happening across the world. These have been overshadowed by events of the last few years. Uh, one of the big debates, and it's very important we are meeting in the year 2022, is that in the last half century or so, the issue of how we make peace with nature has come to be very significant, perhaps as significant as the question of how we make peace among people. The 20th century ended only about two decades ago. There were many things about the 20th century we know, but one of the sad facts of the 20th century is that 200 million people lost their lives in wars, revolutions, civil wars, and armed conflict. By 1945, it was evident that the League of Nations had failed to maintain the peace. And if you recall, the United Nations was founded to banish forever the scourge of war and to try to get the nations of the world, where they differed, and they often do, to try to negotiate. In 1972, something as important as the founding conference of the UN took place, from my viewpoint, which was the first international conference of the human environment. And it took place in a remarkable city, Stockholm, one of the few great European cities spared the ravages of the 30 years crisis, which included the wars we know as the First and the Second World War. Stockholm was a very important moment. There were only two heads of government in Stockholm. Olof Palma, uh, who would tragically be assassinated some years later. The Prime Minister of Sweden was there, but he had to be. 
And the only other head of government who bothered to turn up was the Prime Minister of India, Mrs. Indira Gandhi. Now, you're all aware of the significance of the various uh, conferences of the human environment which have been held since then. Johannesburg, Paris, Copenhagen, and several others. But I think it's significant that when we talk of this notion of a peace with nature, we can't delink it from the question of peace among people. Look at events over the last few years which have, in a sense, put the issue of climate change on the back burner. You can't today look at the news without hearing about the progress, if that is the word, of the conflict in the Ukraine. Uh, the war between Russia and the Ukraine, which in part is also an undeclared conflict between Russia and the United States and its allies. One consequence of this is that in the US, there is much more emphasis on developing fossil fuels to make America self-reliant. We associate this with its former president, Donald Trump, who was very clearly a climate change denier, and we do not associate it with the present president, Mr. Biden, whose party, among other things, in its uh, campaign to win the presidency two years ago, embraced the idea of what they called the Green New Deal. But right now, that's moved a little to the black burner. We're back to looking at coal, fracking, much more emphasis on fossil fuels. It's a similar picture in Europe. Germany, which led the way in phasing out nuclear power, in giving renewables enormous significance, now finds that it is moving away from a reliance on natural gas supplies from Russia. Natural gas is a cleaner form of energy than coal or oil, but it's moving back to fossil fuels. There is a lot of debate about the role of India and China, and I'm sure you'll all agree that both countries have taken huge steps to increase renewables, but both, for various historical reasons, continue to depend and will continue to depend for the foreseeable future on coal and oil. We therefore are in a situation where the international competition between states leads them to acknowledge the significance of climate change. The last conferences which were held, uh, the last one was in Glasgow. There's one beginning in Sharm el Sheikh. In fact, the timing of this talk is it's around 10 days before the uh, COP27, which is to be held at Sharm el Sheikh. But I think we would all agree that at this moment, the divisions between the different nation states are so deep that it's difficult to see the kinds of objectives that were laid out in Paris being fulfilled. Forget about keeping uh, the extent of rise in global temperatures within 1.5 degrees. We are not even sure if 2 degrees will be possible. Let alone net zero by 2050, for which carbon emissions of today, I'm quoting the UN uh, 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 reports, would have to be halved. It's looking very difficult to attain that. This is why I think history matters. Let me share with you an anecdote. You know, during the PhD, you tend to spend some time reading the newspapers. And in the days before newspapers were on the web, you read the physical paper. I still do. It's a fascinating ad which I should have kept. It said, uh, you are in the army as a major. Your unit is under fire. The radio is not working. Help is far away. Three men are wounded. And you're running out of cover. The enemy is advancing. Do you really think an MA in history will help now? I, I don't remember what it said, but I'll try and give you a sense. And it's in the MA will, in history will not help. It won't help you get fresh ammunition. It won't help you contact headquarters. It won't tell you how to give succor to the wounded or stop the adversary. But what it will do is to train you how to think. And it went on to say that the army is looking for people who are fit, but we're looking for men and women who know how to think. And one of the advantages of the historical craft, surely, is that it is about stories. And these are stories with a purpose. They're stories which are grounded in the reality of today. Uh, we know where we stand, but how did we get here? What are the various turns in the road which led us to this particular crossroads? We all know we live in epochal times. They're epochal because since 1945, there has been no worldwide conflagration. The period from 1945 to 73 was a golden age of economic growth. The great historian John McNeil has argued that it's after 1945 that we saw something which economic historians call the Great Acceleration, a surge not only in human numbers, but a surge in economic growth. So if you look at the 20th century to come back, the number of people on Earth at the beginning of the century and later was vastly different. There were four times as many people living on Earth by 2000 as there were in 1900. But if you look at economic growth, the world economy was 14 times the size it was in 1900. This economic transformation was unevenly distributed. We all know that. 
But what is also important is this marvelous transformation of economies not only produce wealth, it also produce waste. So the 20th century was also a time when humans managed to take new technologies to places and levels which it had never reached before. There are many debates about the Anthropocene, when it did and did not begin. And I'm aware that in 1995, the Nobel Prize winning chemist, uh, Paul Trutzen, uh, was to go on to argue that the Anthropocene is a specific historical epoch. It's not an era, it's not a period, it's not a few centuries, it's an entire epoch. And this epoch, he said, is defined by humans acquiring the power of a geological force. I don't know how many of you watch old Hindi films. I was a great fan of Utpal Dutt. Utpal Dutt acted in a film called Bahurani, in which the prospective bridegroom was to be asked lots of questions. I'll translate for those who don't know Hindi. And he was asked, Agar Himalaya na, na hota, to kya hota? And if the Himalaya didn't exist, what would happen? And the correct answer was, Agar Himalaya na hota, to Hindustan mein barish nahi hoti. Or Hamara Desh, Registan Hota. If the Himalaya didn't exist, India would be a desert because the clouds would go after the Tibetan Plateau. So the Tibetan Plateau is in the rain shadow of North India. We don't like admitting it, but it is. And one of the reasons is that the Himalayas are rising at the rate of half a centimeter a year. I just saw a young man wearing a monkey cap and I was telling uh, Professor Nagendra that it's nice to see people wearing monkey caps because whenever I do in winter in Delhi, everybody, even small kids, laugh at me. I see no reason why they should. But one of the reasons we wear monkey caps in North India is that the Himalaya also has an effect on the heat and cold cycles of North India. And I think it's very important to remember this notion of geological force is comparing the human impact to the kinds of forces that have created the Himalaya when these huge tectonic plates clashed of India with the rest of Asia. What is the idea then of humans acquiring this kind of force? When did we acquire it and how? And the conventional date, which Crudzen suggested, no prizes for guessing, is the late 18th century. Sorry to take you back to school textbooks, but in the 1760s, 70s, 80s, there's this cluster of changes which takes place in England. You know, there's James Watt, there's a range of changes, the application of steam and the mining of underground coal to unlock the energy in that coal would transform England within a space of 70, 80 years into something which China is today, the workshop of the world. So wherever you were in the world, after 1815, the seas of the world were ruled by the British. Britain was the world's first superpower. From 1815 to 1945, it ruled the waves. You know, we just went through the coronation of an English king and we have had two prime ministers and you know that song, Britannia, Britannia, Britannia ruled the waves. It, was, it actually meant something. What we tend to forget is that that empire was to be powered by coal. And the control of coal would be particularly important because the British were the first people on earth, or the English rather, to mine coal from underground. Why were they, they the first to get there? The conventional story we all heard, which I'm sure you know, is because of this cluster of inventions, capital, technology, innovation, and so on. That's true. But if you were to look at the world of 1700, you could be forgiven not to be expecting such a transformation to happen in England. As you're aware, in 1700, China and India accounted for 50 to 60% of the world's GDP. If you looked at manufacturers, India accounted for about 25% of them. Southern China was an area where people had burnt coal for centuries. There's remarkable work by Ken Pomeranz called The Great Divergence, which shows us that in China, they did not have the kind of labor shortages and energy shortages that England had. So there's a cluster of secular factors which got together to put England in front. It wasn't preordained. The other, which is a very important point about coal is that in the 1830s and 40s, when coal really begins to spread within the British Isles, in the United Kingdom, not just in UK, but also in parts of Scotland, people who had the capital preferred coal. Not because it was cheaper, but it was easier to control labor. Remember, this was a time of very intense conflicts between those who owned capital and workers. This is long before many of the welfare measures we associate with industrial capitalism had come into play. Remarkable new work by Andreas Malm shows that though water power was actually cheaper, it would have involved huge investments in housing, which nobody was willing to make, or at least the people with money were not willing to make, and they opted for coal. So you know we are living through a period when you have large factories, which employ far fewer people, 
than they would have 10 or 20 years ago because they're so mechanized. Well, that process really begins in a very major way in the 1830s and 40s in England. So British power is built on coal. And this coal-fired empire extends itself through the Mediterranean and North Africa, through South into Southeast Asia. It was powered, and it's very crucial, not just by coal, but by human muscle. You know, prior to fossil fuels, prior to fossil fuels, our sources of energy, the human sources of energy, came from human muscle and animal muscle power. To some extent, they came from wind and falling water. But human muscle power was crucial, remember, in wars. You know, in the First World War and the Second World War, the side which won was the one which had more energy supplies. One of the reasons for the defeat of the Germans when they went into the Soviet Union and overextended across Europe is that they were running out of oil. What is not often known is that even as late as 1941, the largest invasion in human history, three million men crossing the borders, 22nd of June 1941, Operation Barbarossa, Hitler's audacious attempt, which failed to conquer the Soviet Union, Russia in particular, they had three million men and please don't forget, 750,000 horses. And anyone who reads the stories of the Eastern Front, the, the stories of human suffering, hmm, are equally matched by animal suffering. So horses remained very important in European economies, even as late as the 1940s. In the United States, there were more horses being used in the 1920s than there had been in the 1880s. One of the reasons is this technological transformation wasn't absolute. Coal coming in, did not mean the end of human muscle power and animal muscle power. They continued for a while. Oil comes in in a very major way from the early 20th century. The British Empire, as we know, faded after 1945. It took a lot of hard knocks in the First and Second World War. And the sun began to set on Britannia and Britannia ceased to rule the waves somewhere in the 1940s. So the coming of independence to India and Pakistan, a year later to Bangladesh and to uh, Sri Lanka and Burma, would be followed by the retreat of the British Empire from large parts of Africa, particularly in the 1960s and eventually in the 70s. But from the First World War on, we get a new very important power, which has a much larger environmental footprint. The remarkable work on it by Richard Tucker, the title itself is beautiful. It's called Insatiable Appetite. Now, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with American products, hamburgers, chewing gum, tinned fruit, cocoa, Yes, the Americans also consume cocoa, coffee, tea. This book shows how the tropical world is transformed by this enormous American appetite. In the 20s, the symbol of American life would become the first mass-produced motor vehicle in history which was affordable at a price which the middle class could aspire to, the Model T Ford. Anyone and everyone here probably has used some motor transport to come here. Well, I'm not a great fan of Henry Ford. He's not a very nice man, is he? But sometimes people who are not nice leave a mark in our lives. The basic design of the car you and I came in is based on him. It's got an axle, it's got wheels, it's got an internal combustion engine. And the rubber for those tires came from West Africa, particularly from Liberia. And the rubber was made into tires by a Firestone company. If Americans went into the supermarket, they would buy bananas. The United States doesn't grow bananas. Small number in Florida, not the ones they like. It was the Honduras, which was run largely by the United Fruit Company. So the United States pioneers a new kind of domination, which is empire without colonies. And it's very crucial that between 1908 and 68, US consumption of oil, the extent to which the American economy is dependent on oil, goes from 8 to 68%. So if Britain was the first coal-fired global empire, the United States was the first oil-fired global empire. I repeat, there was nothing preordained about these countries coming here with some changes in our narrative. What applied to the Industrial Revolution in England could apply to parts of Scandinavia, could apply to Germany, could apply to France, and could eventually apply to Russia and parts of Eastern Europe. Japan was a latecomer in the 1870s to the Industrial Revolution. One of the very important features about the Industrial Revolution is that it opened up a yawning gap between the countries which were industrialized and those that were not. You know, one of the advantages of studying in Oxford is I had a very interesting college supervisor who went by the rather unlikely surname was of Darwin. And he got fed up of students asking him, are you actually related to Charles Darwin? And before you completed, he'd say, yes, I'm his great grandson, but I'm not interested in biology. And uh, he often quoted a very interesting 
ditty, which the British liked in Africa. It said, we have the Maxim gun and they don't. I'm sure you've heard this, you know, the Maxim gun was an automatic repeater gun. But quite aside from that, I think the control of the trade routes of the seas was to be of enormous significance. Look at two very interesting reasons. In the 17th century, the first major sugar plantations are set up in Jamaica. Now, Jamaica, to those who are lovers of cricket, it was the home of the great Sir Garfield Sobers. And Jamaica, of course, is famous not for sugar, but another product which sugar helps to make, rum. But the West Indies and the Caribbean, they found very soon, could not support sugar without slaves. And in this period, you start the beginnings of a vast slave trade from West Africa, which involves 9 to 10 million people being shipped from West Africa to the Americas. Initially the Caribbean, then parts of Latin America, and you got it, the southern United States, which was importing slaves to Israel as late as the 1800s. All those wonderful cotton mills of Manchester and Lancashire. Uh, one of the things I recall of my school days, which uh, Harini fortunately didn't talk about, is that in the 1970s, we went to a very nice mystery school where, among other things, there were things which are now exterminated, thank God, like caning, hitting with a ruler. And we actually had a teacher who specialized in throwing dusters at us. I'm happy to say she always missed because we ducked before the duster hit us. I sometimes wonder what if the duster had actually hit one of us. I'm afraid we lived in a day when our parents might have said that, you know, you must have done something naughty. I'm sure it's not the teacher's fault. It's a very different world in the 21st century and thank, thank our stars for that. But one of the things I remember about geography lessons with Mrs. Nazareth, God bless her soul, is that she always said, don't believe what's written in the textbooks about Lancashire. Lancashire was not a center of cotton manufacturing because it was damp and it was easy to weave it. It was important because they got cheap cotton. They got the cotton cheap from countries to which they sold the textiles. And one of the places they got the cotton cheap, not to be forgotten, was what is today the United States of America. The United States of America, particularly the South, so important in American politics today, was a source of raw cotton which was grown by slaves. Now we all know in the 1860s, there was the American Civil War, Lincoln led the Union to its victory and to the emancipation of the slaves. What you may not know, and as a historian I should bring out, is that that period, 1860 to 65, was an incredible heaven-sent opportunity for cultivators, farmers, traders, transporters across Western India. This is a period when there was a huge expansion of the acreage of cotton. It was possible to export cotton from India to England. And this raw material brought back lots of money. So there's something called the cotton boom. And many of the families which went into industry later made money in the cotton boom. As with all booms, it ended. It ended because once the civil war was over, the supplies resumed and it was possible to get American cotton to the British uh, manufacturers and Indian cotton went through a downslide. I'm emphasizing this because I was very struck, Professor Nagendra referred to three major changes. The collapse of biodiversity, the expansion of chemical contamination and pollution, and climate change. You find all of these beginning to be very significant in the 19th century for the first time on a global scale. And the British Empire plays a very critical role in enabling the unification of markets across the world. Britain ruled, one tends to forget, 25%, 25% of the land area of the earth. As of 1918, it was the largest empire the world had ever seen. Which, which was reasonably stable for 50, 100, 150 years, depending how you count it. Within this empire, it's very crucial, it was possible to move commodities around, even to places which were formerly not part of the empire. The other major transformation comes about from the 1840s. Britain, along with other countries, was very upset with the Qing rulers of China, who were shutting out and trying to stamp down something as pernicious as the drug trade. Uh, the opium trade. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the remarkable trilogy of the great Amitav Ghosh, it's a remarkable book, The River of Fire, and he, he shows us the significance of merchants. One of them is a very important Indian Parsi merchant, of course a fictional character, who are deeply invested in the trade. So there's opium grown in India, taken into China. Opium is a remarkable product because supply creates demand. And China creates or it, they assist in the creation in China of the world's largest population ever of drug addicts. And the Chinese government comes in and tries to stop it. There are a series of wars, two huge wars, the opium wars. The Chinese market is opened up. But just keep an eye on this, the triangular trade. Indian opium marketed in China, 
taken by British ships, British insurance companies. The Chinese tea taken to Britain. Hmm? Kappa tea, that's where it began. It began earlier, but it became popular then. And the same ships come back to India with British manufacturers. Now, it's very, very critical. This period of the 18th, 19th century, the pivot of the world transforms. And the transformation of that pivot was not because of the inventiveness, the genius, the enterprise, the technology, none of which should be denied, of a handful of northern European countries. It was also because many of these countries controlled the terms of trade with others. That figure, 1700, Indian textiles, remarkable new work by Prasandan Parthasarathy with the title which I would kill for because I, but I, there's no point because you can't do that and he's written the book anyway and none of us knows enough to write that book, do we? It's called Why Europe Got Rich and Asia Did Not. It's a one-line argument. It's a one-line argument. Perhaps he exaggerates, but why not? It is that tariff controls came in as early as the 1720s, 30s, 40s, preventing Indian textiles from entering European markets. And the tariffs which could have assisted India from the 1760s went down as Britain took control of larger parts of India. So this yawning gap which we get, India, China, Asia with Europe, actually opens up in the 19th century. Now, how is all this possibly important to climate change? Let me go back to 1972. I began by saying that there were only two heads of government who were present. One was the Prime Minister of Sweden, Olaf Palma, socialist, Sweden had not fought in the first or the second world wars. The last time Sweden fought in a war was in 1711. And believe it or not, they invaded Russia. It's a very vast empire, the Swedes. What they are today is a shadow of their former self. Sweden in the 1970s had had for many years a social democratic government which boasted some of the finest welfare regimes on earth. It's the only country, first country in the world, by the way, where not only men, women, but men get paternity, get leave when the baby is born. But the Swedish had a sub-clause which says the man on paternity leave, if they don't do housework properly, you can be reported, can not only be called back to work, but they can dock the pay which they gave you. This is very interesting. And Palma, Sweden, was a country where the environment and nature were very important to the notion of a Swedish identity. Sweden had distinguished itself by staying away from the great Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union, did not join either military bloc. For many years, it was one of the very few European countries which supported the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. The other leader was Mrs. Indira Gandhi. And her speech is very relevant to the big debate on climate change today. She argued in her speech that poverty is the greatest polluter. Now, this statement is often taken out of context and used to argue that, oh, the Prime Minister of India said poverty is the greatest polluter. She did. But if you look at the whole of that passage, she goes on to argue, how can you protect a forest and the animals that live within it if the people who live on its fringes come in conflict with those animals? The only way to conserve the forest, she argued, was to bring those people aboard. Now, these are not policies she always adhered to, but for once she was saying the right thing. She further went on, to take a stand on something of enormous significance in the climate change debate and in the environmental debates of the 1970s. What was at the root of the environmental crisis? The answer was simple, according to many scholars in the West, two of whom stand out for the title of their book, The Population Bomb, Paul and Anne Ehrlich, very great scholars. They later revised their views and all credit to them. They argued that the problem of the environment was an issue of population. Ehrlich had gone so far as to write in his book, that he went to the streets of Kolkata to such an offensive paragraph, it was deleted by his publishers later. And he said, wherever I looked, there were people, 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 population, 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 and so on and so forth. So Mrs. Gandhi took this view head on and argued that the citizen of a North American or European country consumes far more energy, has a much larger impact on the global environment than a citizen of a developing country. And she went on to say that the developing countries did value the environment. But in order to tackle the issues of the environment, they needed access to modern science, modern technology, and to the funds to tackle this crisis. She was not alone. The Chinese, who at that time did not have very good relations with India, we did not even have diplomatic relations, the Chinese delegate made an even more interesting statement. It's a very oft-quoted statement. Like a lot of things the Chinese say, it's a parable. You can read whatever you want into it, but I'll share it with you. It said, of all things, people are the most precious. There's something very significant happening here. The developed and the developing world were not dividing on ideological lines of capitalism and communism. 
It was not between democratic government and one party state. It was not between the market economy and the planned economy. It was not the Cold War kind of divide. It was what would come to be called the North-South divide. And one of the dimensions of the North-South divide is the developed world argued that the root of the problem is population growth. And no prizes for guessing, 40% uh, of the people who live on the earth are in China and India. South Asia, that is the Sark countries, have more people than China. For historical reasons, which I can't go into, the valleys of the Huangho, the Yangtze Kiang, the, the Mekong, Brahmaputra, Ganga, Indus are the most densely populated places on earth, for reasons I can't get into right now. But what it ignored is that the environmental footprint of a human being depends on who they are, where they are, and what they do. To paraphrase from the great Amartya Sen, Amartya Sen famously would argue in the 80s that famines do not occur because of a shortage of food. There may be a shortage of food, but there are famines which have occurred when there's an abundance of food. He said the problem is the absence of entitlement. And he presented, uh, remarkably shown in the great Bangla film, which I urge all of you to see, at least the opening sequences, they're very difficult to watch, Akaler Shandhaner, The Sound of Famine, which shows a beautiful Bengal countryside Butterflies splitting around, a bumper harvest and people starving to death because they didn't have the money to get to the food. Also, the food was shipped off for the war effort. And there were traders who were making money and it was British policy. But to come back, the environmental footprint of different human beings is uneven and of different states is uneven. And one of the great changes of the 20th century, which we are all aware of, I referred to the end of the British Empire, is the number of nation states on earth went up. So in the 20th century, the number of people on earth went up fourfold. But the earth is a unified ecological system. It's not a unified political system. Everybody anywhere on earth lives within something called a nation state. Or you live in an area claimed by more than one nation state. Or you live inside a nation state among a group of people who want to be another nation state. I can go on and on. But the world, at least the terrestrial area, the land surface, that 30%, is divided into nation states. There are four times as many nation states today as in 2014. But they are unequal. They are unequal in their economic size. In 1945, when the Second World War ended, the United States accounted for 40 to 45% of the gross world product. It had emerged largely unscathed through the Second World War. The only part of the United States which suffered direct assault, as we all know, was Pearl Harbor, 7 December 1941. Philippines, which was a, effectively a protector of the United States, though nominally independent. By contrast, Europe was ravaged. Much of the Soviet Union was ravaged, 27 million dead. China was ravaged, 14 million dead. We don't think about it, but India, Indians, 2.5 million fought in the war, 2.2 million to be precise. By the way, 3,000 elephants also served in the Allied forces in East Asia under the command of the redoubtable Lord Mountbatten, though it's not in his memoirs. Remember, those animals are still important. But I think at the end of the Second World War, the United States stood at the pinnacle of its power. It was challenged. But it was economically enormously significant. 30 years ago, we went through another moment. The end of the so-called Cold War. I say so-called because during the Cold War, there was no direct armed conflict in Europe and North America. And some parts of the alliance areas such as Japan, Australia, New Zealand. In the rest of the world, there were many wars. There are various estimates in the Cold War of how many people died. But at the end of the Cold War, when the Soviet Union collapsed, China got caught up in the Tiananmen Square in the systemic crisis. It looked like one side had won. It was clear who lost, but nobody was very clear who won. And I am very struck that it's around the time of the end of the Cold War that environmental consciousness came back with a new surge. There was a great environmental awakening across the world in the late 1960s. There was concern about ecocide in Vietnam. There was concern across the world about population growth. There was concern about chemical contamination. Uh, the Stockholm Conference, even though it did not bring many heads of state, it brought many ministers together. It led to the creation of the UN Environment Program. In much of the developing world, there were new kinds of assertions. In India, there was the Chipko Andolan. There was a very important movement uh, which was brewing in southern India, which would culminate in the struggle to save Silent Valley. There were counterparts in many other countries. But in the late 1980s and early 90s, a new kind of concern emerged. And I think it's very important to remember this, that the insights of the sciences, which had been growing in the post-war period, 
actually acquired planetary voice and photo. They were not new. They were earlier voices. There's the remarkable work in 1962 of Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, where she talked about the petrochemical revolution and argued that technology was largely linear. It was trying to solve problems by taking them apart. It was not looking at its own implications. She famously argued that it would be a tragedy if a mindless chemical technology, which was unleashed on a few insects, would end up pitting us against the earth itself. It's a remarkable phrase of hers and every student who reads it comes back and say, I didn't know scientists could write so well. And of course, you say she's a rare teacher of both the world of the sciences and the literary, uh, and the literary crafts and arts. It was Barry Commoner in the early 70s who argued again that technology tended to be reductionist and he argued for a more holistic view. I think by the end of the 80s, there was enough evidence coming together which led to the UN Framework on Climate Change, 1994. Note the date, a year before Paul Crutz in 1995. So we are today in a period when there has been almost three decades of debate on the question of climate change. And the question of climate change cannot be regarded as separate from the larger question of the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene, just to go back, is a time when humans acquire the power of a geological force to transform the life systems of the Earth. I want to emphasize this a little carefully. We are not talking about the survival of the planet. The planet is 4 billion years old. It will outlast whatever folly or uh, you know games humans may play. We are talking about life systems on the planet. The life systems on the planet consist not just of the atmosphere, the lithosphere, the hydrosphere. Hope I haven't left anything out. Well, I have, haven't I? The, the atmosphere, lithosphere, hydrosphere also consist of its diverse life forms. There are very various estimates. How many life forms are there or not? Earlier they said 1 million, then they said 5 million, then they said 10 million. The wag in me says, hey, but you just told me there's a biodiversity crisis, but you guys are keeping on discovering new species every day. I was horrified to read in a book by E.O. Wilson, and my students are even more horrified. In a book of his on page 2 or 3, he says life exists everywhere. Brace yourself. There are 14 species of mites which live under our eyelashes. I hope that doesn't exclude anyone in this room, because if it did, it would mean the ecosystem is not functioning. But I think this great dying, the snapping of the various links on the earth was also part of this economic and political transformation. I'm sure all of you in this film, in, the, in this room, uh, have heard about the biodiversity crisis. But I'm sure even your best friends in the room have seen one of the versions of Jurassic Park. It's a very famous film. It's even been made in Tamil and Telugu and Mandarin. And I think it's done more to popularize dinosaurs than all the work done by paleontologists. It's a different matter where how accurate it is. But it's significant that the idea of Jurassic Park, extinct species coming back to life, is so popular in art, culture, cinema. You know, I meet three-year-olds who are quite amused that I don't know the full form of T-Rex. And they tell me, uncle, it's called a dinosaur. And of course, when I ask them, what does it do? They all roar at the top of their voice and I pretend to be scared. And then they do it again and again and again and again. But isn't it paradoxical? We're so fascinated with creatures long extinct, just at the time when we're living through probably the largest episode of extinctions, which has occurred in many epochs. There have been five major extinctions. We're probably living through the sixth. Many of these extinctions also were powered not just by population growth, but by specific economic, technological, and capital transformations. One of the big transformations, very difficult for us to grasp, is what has happened to the world's oceans. Between 1500 and 1800, and again 1800 to around 1970s, so vast hunting of the greatest mammals that have ever existed in human history, the whales. Many of them were just hunted out. By the 1970s, it was possible to open a Time magazine and mug up. You know, it's nice those days we liked mugging up things. Before the internet, everyone was impressed. Now nobody is. They just pop up and say, hey, you got it wrong. It said, do you know that three whales are killed every hour? And I think this huge transformation of whale blubber into industrial product, I emphasize, was part of the manner in which the oceans were tapped for this huge economic expansion. The other, which is well known, is the great onslaught on the forests of the world particularly after 1945. This, of course, gathered a lot of force during the Second World War and took on more later. So where are we today then? I began by saying that history will help us to know where we are, why we're here, and it might give us an idea 
of where we ought to go. And there will be differences on where we ought to go and much more than that on how we ought to get there. So the nations of the world which agreed to prevent the scourge of war have succeeded in preventing another nuclear war. This is not a minor accomplishment. Another nuclear war would have led to the annihilation of civilization as we know it. And since the environmental crisis is all often about despair, desolation, bad news, let me share some good news. One of the great changes between 1987 and now is that 85 to 87 percent of the nuclear weapons on earth have been decommissioned. The end of the Cold War led to a historic pact between the United States, Soviet Union, later Russia, which they have so far held to. This is a very important transformation. The other is that the same year, 1987, was the year of the Montreal Protocol. One of the great changes in the Anthropocene, brought about to a large extent by refrigeration, is the release of a very important greenhouse gas, a set of greenhouse gases known as chlorofluorocarbons. It's a very complicated word. We'll just call it CFCs. Well, the CFC uh, is 24 times more serious in terms of driving up heat than carbon dioxide. Good news. Between 1987 and now, the ozone hole in the ozone layer in the North and South Pole have both closed because there was unprecedented cooperation between the United States and the rest of the world, driven by a major American company, which had the technology, DuPont, normally one of the bad guys in environmental stories, but in this case, it aligned with the Republican Party, Ronald Reagan, international science, and they managed to both transfer technology and share the cash. This, however, has not proved possible, I want to emphasize, with climate change. Here, there are fundamental divisions between developed and developing countries, between those who export fossil fuels and import them, those who have the technologies and those who don't. Over the last 50 years, and going back to the energy crisis of 73, one of the big debates has been, how can we move from the fossil fuel age to the solar age? I have to share with you a joke from Punch. I'm running out of time, but it's such a nice joke, I can't forget it. One dinosaur asked another, what comes after death? And the other said, didn't you know? Petroleum. So I think it's very important. The, the coal and the oil is the result of not to be repeated geological processes. So fossil fuels are also solar powered, but it's packed solar energy. It's something like a vitamin capsule. You know, when you were small, you were asked to have lots of vitamin capsules. Sometimes you went overboard and ate 10 of them, not knowing it's bad for you. Something like that. The release of the chemical compounds embodied in the fossil fuels has happened at such an incredible rate that 75 to 80% of all the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere have been released after 1945. There are estimates that half is since 1990. How do you get off the train? Well, there's two bits of good news. First, all the nations of the world agree that we need to get off the train. Second, the major economies, the United States, China, Europe, India, I may have left one or two out, have pledged dates by which they will get to net zero. There are various dates, 2050, 2060, 2070. And now comes the interesting part. Nobody is quite sure how to get there. Because, because there is a conflict between state interests, individual states, and the common interest of humanity. The state system drives countries to compete with each other. In the past, they competed for how large their armies would be. You know the famous Hindi film, Shole, the most incredible dialogue ever in a Hindi film, Kitne Admi The, how many men did, did you have, or how many men did he have, has been replaced by Kitna Koila Hai, how much coal do they have, how much oil do they have, how much gas do they have. The other is, this is not simply a problem of technology or a problem of finance. It's also a problem of the way of thinking. If you think of the earth as a living system, which makes peoples, countries, states interdependent on each other, it's impossible to hive off the economic activities that sustain life, livelihood, and even wealth creation and distribution from ecological processes. Think of the last few months. Think of the floods in Bangalore, the enormous glacial burst in Pakistan, the dry spells in Russia, Ukraine, and parts of the American Midwest, the unseasonal sharp heavy rains which have devastated crops for the third year in a row in parts of Maharashtra and the first time in many years in parts of North India. So these changes are part of what is happening in the global system. But what we know about the past is this. Change happens when there is enough pressure, enough popular concern to drive those who are powerful to act. That is how the changes of the 20th century came about. 
women moving towards equal rights in society. The idea of people of different genders being equal human beings. The idea that, that there would be equality irrespective of race, caste, creed, color, the shape or size of your nose, how you cut your hair, who you prayed to or did not pray. The fact that every people had the right to determine their own future. These are not things which could be taken for granted. They came about through enormous public debate, upheaval and struggle. What does it mean when we take that logic to the idea of a peace with nature? Does it mean equality beyond humanity? Does it mean equality beyond today's generation to the future? Whose generation are we talking about? A 60-year-old human lifespan? Or believe it or not, the Atlantic bowhead whale, which by the way lives 250 years. There could have been a whale which was coasting around in 1780s was still gamboling around in the Arctic Ocean. When we think of these timescales, there's an enormity of it that comes upon us. But the reverse is very crucial. Environmental transformation has been driven by a combination of scientific insight into how nature works, public and popular concern, and public action. And that combination is vital. How do we get there? What do we do? That is a wonderful subject, but it's time to end and maybe reserve that for another talk. Thank you very much. So first of all, I think I should thank Professor Angrajan for this excellent talk. And as I did promise, he would integrate a number of things, I think, from Shole to climate change in a lecture, which is probably one of the few things that only he can do. I think, I mean, there's, there's a lot of ground to cover. So I have a number of questions, but I'll reserve mine for, the, for later. We'd maybe start with audience questions. And if uh, now, one more environment issue again. Sakash to Varat will Martha Idi Sarkar or Tinder, Kendra Sarkar Raja Sarkar in the NG Tinner Itchi Chige Fine Gold Akta there. Solid waste management rule violet murder. Either Dodda Matadale, Yakandra Yapata Yent country in a lay solid waste management problem with there. Adike now. Yen Marbe Kun Terbutu, Azamel Tumba, Diana Marta Divi, Adike Sarkar Vatienda, Yen Marbe Kun Terbutu, Auratan Checha Marta Divi, Ekan the Idrinda, environment to Tumba damage acta. Global level Lale, Idu Sakashtu, Dodda Paranama built there, Ekan the Parani Pakshigulge, Manishurge, Yella Kareidu, Dodda, Anauta, Wagi, Tumba Dodam, Dodda Matadali Dundu. Now, challenge at Tombe Cacta. Yerkisha Elta di Vendre Yella country in Alindano, Navo, Berebere, Vasa Vasa, practical development Martha di Ve, other recycle process other than a technology development Martha. I'll just translate for the rest of the audience. Uh, so, the gentleman is, a, is an activist who has been working at the state level, city level, state level, and a national level for a long time and has also filed cases and been part of cases in the in, in National Green Tribunal. And what he's pointing to is that solid waste management is a huge challenge for our cities. And uh, he's also asking for uh, technology to be developed in India because he says the, the products that we consume come from outside. And we are left with the waste. And we need, when we have uh, industries and we have technological prowess in India, we need to actually tackle this problem. And why can't we get more in-house or in-Indian uh, technologies to tackle the solid waste problem? So. Uh, it's an excellent question. And in last uh, 30 years, the waste per urban citizen has gone up around 80-fold. It's extremely well put. A uh, lot of this is plastic. A lot of it is material which cannot be recycled. And uh, this is happening at a time when, in much of industrial world, many of these materials have been phased out. Or they are in the process of being phased out. So this is a very good question. And uh, these wastes affect the water bodies, the flow of water, the various life forms. This is equally true not only of consumer goods, such as plastic waste, but of automobiles. There are around 2 million discarded automobiles every year. And uh, 
in most industrialized countries, the person, the company which makes the car, it is their response to take back the car and recycle it. When I say recycle, a lot of the aluminum can be recycled, a lot of the rubber can be recycled, the engine oil has to be stored. And we need very strong public action. It's very, uh, very positive, very encouraging that uh, Sir and others have filed a case. They are raising public consciousness, local, state, federal. But beyond that, we need strong public action because the reality is that much of that waste recycling can generate a lot of jobs. But more serious, we need technological change which looks at a circular rather than a linear economy. And is absolutely a valid point. It needs a very, very fundamental shift in the uh, kind of production. So thank you, it's a very, very important point. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Sneha, and first of all, I wanted to say thank you. It was a, I mean, I'm buzzing with ideas because of what you said and the number of connections you've drawn. Um, I'm going to be as quick as possible, but I had three sets of questions for you, uh, touching upon various aspects. One thing that you talked about was uh, Rachel Carson. And uh, I was actually thinking of Mori Bookchin, who wrote the book, Our Synthetic Environment, even before Rachel Carson, Carson published hers. And he linked not only environment, he talked about synthetic environment, but he also was a stringent, he was an anarchist, and he criticized capitalism. And to me, I was very grateful, at least the um, acknowledgement of the economic system that's at the root of so many of these problems. Because today, uh, as somebody said, um, you know, environmental critique without class consciousness is just gardening, right? Like in the sense, so where is that sort of domination coming in? So I wanted to hear you talk about also why somebody like Murray Bookchin, who wrote a book even before, is now almost to a point, and he also talks about decentralization, urbanization without cities. Um, in the sense of what happens to people who saw and who made these radical critiques, and they're called radicals. So they don't belong to our um, courses in environmental history that we study in universities today. Uh, that's one. Two, you talked about modernity, science, but I also wanted you to touch upon spirituality. Because I was thinking in the context of, I mean, when we talk about colonization and, you know, as the colonized people, it's also a destruction of a worldview, right? And to me, there is something of the logics of domination that we continue to reproduce even within our cities because today the idea of the modern city is not of what is a modern Bangalore it is a Singapore that we would want to see here so I was hoping if you could talk a little bit about the fact that today some of the green spaces in our cities and in our country are religious sites are sacred spaces so where does modernity science and rationalism come in and actually severs the connection that people have with nature. And the last question is even your dichotomy that you pose it, nature and peace with people, as peace with nature, peace with people, which I think I wanted to critique because eco-feminists have shown that that's not a separate question, it's the same, right? In the sense that uh, there is a certain kind of, why are human beings not nature? The understanding that we are separate from nature and that we are superior to nature is at the root of so many systems of domination or ideologies of domination. So I was curious if you could comment on these because a lot of the solutions seems, seem to become apparent when we change the questions, right? So yeah, that's... Okay, these are all excellent. I'm just in the interest of time since I've seen... The, maybe, no, I'm not saying take a few, but maybe you could respond to one and then we'll come back to the others at the end if we have time. Yeah. But great questions. So they're all related. I mean, Carson was an outstanding writer. And uh, if you read the book extremely carefully, which I'm sure you have, she is very clear that we cannot have a notion of dollar at any cost. So I think this critique of uh, runaway economic growth, and as you're well aware, uh, Bookchin is a very important book, but the kind of attack that Carson was subject to, particularly by not only the large pesticide companies, by US uh, Department of Agriculture and others, led to congressional hearings. So, you know, no idea originates with one person. There will always be precursors to any idea. We can go backward and find people before Bookchin. Uh, so, I, I take your, your point very well. But I still think Carson matters. Because I think transformation of public consciousness in terms of debate, uh, I doubt there is anyone who has equaled her uh, on that scale. It's also to do with the timing, the place, and, and all of that. I completely, uh, you know, one of the reasons I was hinting at the notion of equality beyond humanity is that we may need to draw on a lot of other notions 
where the non-human and human are seen as part of a continuum. This is related to your other question. But there's a paradox here. See, many countries which have put sacrality at the center of identity and have done an incredible job of restoring nature have also devastated it. I have in mind the remarkable case of ecological restoration in Israel, or particularly of extinct species of plants and animals. It's remarkable what they've accomplished. And I asked an Israeli, how can a reserve be only 20 square kilometers? And they said, you know what, this is Israel. Do you have any idea what 20 square kilometers? And I said, yeah, I got it. But that same system has also desacralized a lot of other lands. It has captured much of the water. Much of the struggle on the West Bank is not about the land, it's about the water. And there's a huge disparity between Palestinian Arab use of water and Israeli Jewish use of water. So while one accepts and understands the importance of spirituality as distinct from religion, when it comes into public life, one person's sacrality can be another person's destruction of life. I think this question of peace with nature, you know, that was a play on words. I think it's a little compl complex, which I'm sure you'll agree with. Humans are both part of nature and in some senses distinct from it. To give a simple instance, you see, think of uh, the AIDS virus or the COVID virus or something so important in human history as the plague. These are, or malaria, but obviously we are part of that universe. You see the black rat, the mosquito, the plasmodium or falciparium parasite or the COVID-19 virus. Our biology is part of that biology. But at the same time, we are different from them. So for instance, one of the reasons that the so-called Spanish flu sp spread so fast was because in the war, huge numbers of men moved from place to place and humans, the, you know, there, there were ships which carried the plague from A to B to C. So I think this is a complex issue and uh, I'm not suggesting that it's so simple. But the reason I use the word nature here is my reference is to systems uh, of in which the flow of material, say nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, or compounds such as H2O, are not only part of material flow processes, those material flows are intrinsically linked to a variety of organisms. But we are both part of that and apart from it. Now, when we got apart from it, we can have a big debate. Whether it's eco-feminism, capitalism, socialism, state building, origins of agriculture fire, we can have a fascinating debate on it. But I, I, I think these are all remarkable questions. I think each uh, requires much more thinking. And I want to emphasize that I am not qualified to solutionize. I think one of the problems of the environmental debate is Far too much of it is about solutionizing. Much more ought to be about problematizing. I think all of the three posers you put problematize. Where do ideas originate? What do we about notions of the self which go beyond material world? And how do we look at differing values and ideas of nature? Each of these is a profound problematizing question. And I think we should continue this debate. And I thank you for bringing it up. I, I'm not sure that I've answered any. And I think they require a lot of thought. Thank you so much. My name is Nagarjun. Thank you for, for marvelous talk. I was going to say something about capital and class consciousness, but Sneha has done an excellent job of doing that already. So I'll pass. But I do have a question on degrowth. So people have been talking about degrowth for some years now. And I was wondering if you have... Sorry, what is degrowth? Degrowth. De oh, yeah. okay. um, the idea that even if you do switch to renewable fuels, eventually capital's growth requirements will destroy the planet. So people have been talking about degrowth, Hickel and people like that. I'm wondering if you have a view on that. Thank you. See, one of the important things about capital, it's a social relation. And uh, one of the advantages of being from old agrarian civilizations in India and China is we can look at capital before capitalism. There are different forms of capital. Capital is a social relationship. Uh, and in that social relationship, some of the wealth is not for immediate consumption. It's for the future. That's a simple way of putting it. Then we can debate whether the person with capital takes away labor and stores it or takes away energy and stores it. There are various definitions. I'm hesitant about degrowth. I know less about it. Uh, I'm sure I'd love to learn more from you for a very important reason. We are still in a world where a vast population lacks basic food, housing, shelter. An astonishingly large number of people remain malnourished. And if you look at two simple indicators of 
two, three simple indices. I know we'll all differ on indices. What is the rate of child survival to the age of five? What is the level of nutrition among women? What is the lifespan of a woman or a man from the lower strata? And I think that one broad view which has emerged over the last 50 years is that economic growth of certain kinds can help address these problems. It's not adequate, but you still need the growth. And I would rather, this is my personal preference, very important book on growth by Vaclav Smil, where he argues you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. It's a one-line argument. Well, there's news for those who are doomsday syndrome people. Population growth is plateauing worldwide. The era of high economic growth is probably over. The kind of economic growth that was there globally, 45 to 73 is over. The, giant, the kind of economic expansion of the East Asian economies in the 70s, 80s is over. The kind of vast economic transformation of China which was there is over. It's unlikely that any country will grow at 8 to 10% in the coming 20, 50 years for a variety of technological reasons. But rather than degrowth, can we have other kinds of growth? And surely, if one were to look at vast parts of sub-Saharan Africa, vast numbers of people in South Asia, I'm just talking of these two, growth is still an imperative. But the kind of growth is a different uh, question. Degrowth looks attractive to the most industrialized parts of the world. It's not a coincidence. It's most attractive in Western Europe, most urbanized, among the highest per capita income, among the highest energy use, doesn't use any GMOs, but imports them from the rest of the world. Has a low carbon footprint because much of the manufacturing got exported to East Asia and China. I'm not saying it happened because of, that's, the, that's the unintended consequence. So I'm a little hesitant to embrace it, but we, we can and should debate this. You know, it's a very, very important question. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Amudia. Uh, one of my questions is, I have actually two questions. One was about, uh, you spoke about how, uh, you know, environment consciousness grew in the 90s. And I was more interested in how the protests, you know, how protests have grown since then. It might be something like Chipko and Apiko here in Karnataka to something like what we are seeing now where uh, uh, just stop oil is, you know, just attacking the uh, uh, museums and everything. So the whole, how protests themselves have evolved. And as individuals, you know, is there a way... Uh, can an uh, alternative mode of, you know, uh, protest, can that can it come up? So I just wanted to understand the history of environmental protests. So that's one. And uh, the second one was uh, you were talking about renewable energy and how we need to, you know, move from coal to solar and everything. So um, I was just thinking about even when it comes to solar, there are like many challenges as to, you know, uh, uh, renew, uh, what is that? Um, recycling the solar panels, how do we, what do we do about that? And even something as simple as land acquisition, which is a huge issue in India, where, uh, you know, the very people who will be most affected by environmental, you know, degradation and uh, this one, are their lands are being, you know, confiscated or uh, uh, taken for these large, uh, you know, renewable projects, because of course, solar, uh, you know, farms need large lands. So, so does really, you know, renewable energy is the, uh, I mean, going towards renewable energy when we have problems like this is a solution with the challenge sides. Thank you. I think you put it so well. See, it's a technological fix to move from, say, coal to gas, or in a different context, to look at denudation of forest uh, from wood or wood charcoal or coal to gas, you know, I'm, I'm in my late 50s. I've seen it in my lifetime in the kitchen I grew up in. We started with wood, we moved to wood charcoal, went to the Angeti and ended up with gas. Each of these has different footprints. You're absolutely right. This idea that we'll press a button, bring this new technology and solve it is ignoring the context. The environment is about more than just the environment. Just that climate change is about more than just the climate change. It is also about people forms of livelihood, ecological systems, land, water, air, and how they are impacted. In a country where the density of population is 400 to a square kilometer, that's India's density of population, where half the area, land area is cultivated, half is not. 
there are people dependent on both halves. I want to emphasize it very strongly. There is no such thing as a wasteland. The people dependent on the cultivated land, the cultivable land, there are people dependent on the non-cultivated land. There are also people dependent on the coastal and surface waters. As with nuclear energy, same with solar energy. Two elements are rarely factored into the equation. First, where is the land? Second, where is the water? It's very important. If you factor in the water and the land, so let's do the large math. It's very easy. 2% of the land area of the earth, 18% of the population, 4 to 5% of the fresh water, and 22% of the domestic ungulates. So you see, if you add all this black buck, neil guy, sambar, rufus, hare, uh, kiang, all of those guys, they're very few compared to the domestic ungulates. And you're absolutely correct. One of the issues of solar power is that it will take up areas where sunlight is abundant, which are not cultivated, but which are very important for the livestock economy. And the livestock economy is important to everyone in the room. Many people here are wearing leather shoes. Those who are not have consumed some milk product. Many of us, when it's going to get colder, are going to wear wool. So it's part of us. And you know, one, one of the great transformations in India over the last 30 odd years is mutton and poultry have massively expanded production. Hmm. And that is generating a lot of livelihood. And this definitely needs, we need a holistic pattern of thinking. And your other question, I think one of the positive elements is the growth of consumer consciousness. It's very important. And we all know that consumer consciousness has been very important across the world uh, in taking certain products off the market. Think of something really significant in the 1960s and 70s across the world. Not an environmental issue, but a very important issue. Baby food. Baby food. Nestle, one of the greatest corporations in human history, was taken on. Mother's milk is the best. So huge transformation. Nobody believed this would succeed. The other is the phasing out of smoking in public places. Who thought big tobacco would ever be defeated? These are huge. But this doesn't apply to many environmental issues. And the reason it doesn't apply is this is not only an issue as a consumer, it's also an issue as a producer. And here there's something very critical about countries such as India and South Asia, Asia and Africa. Many people in these societies who are consumers are also producers. See, when we look at the United States, 2% of the labor force is in agriculture. When we look at Europe, 3% of the population is agriculture. China, 50-55% of Chinese live in cities. India is not only 60-65% rural, 40% plus of the labor force is in agriculture. If you take those indirectly dependent on agro-processing, it will easily be over 50. So what happens in a society where the producer is also a consumer? So simply changing consumption isn't the answer. It has to deal with the issues of production. So the production of milk, meat, food, fiber, fertile, uh, uh, fish, all of those things. What is its environmental cost? Who's bearing it? And these transitions, if they happen in a manner, and they often are, let's face it, where they enormously increase, the livelihood dilemmas for that underclass, which is vast, or even the lower middle class, which is also vast. That's not a desirable outcome. It may happen. It is happening. It's happening in China. You know, one tends to think of China as a communist country. It is. For those of you who are interested, there's a fantastic book by Richard McGregor called The Party. And it, it has an incredible, incredible opener. It says the Chinese leadership discovered the only way to preserve the communist party was to promote capitalism. But they decided to control the capitalists. And it's a hilarious book. There is a secret cell of the Communist Party, he obviously got into it, which controls the capitalists. And each of the top 100 or 500 capitalists has a red phone which only rings. It seems you can't make a phone. And when, they, when that phone rings, they stand up and answer it and they have to follow orders. So this Jack Ma phenomenon. So China is in this incredible situation. It's got a Communist Party trying to control capitalism. And one dimension it is really worried about is the environmental impact of runaway growth. One of the huge debates in China is about what do you do with growth which damages the environment. And many of them, there are similarities, parallels, contrasts, you know, contradictions what's happening in India. And I completely endorse the idea of responsible consumers, but I think we need to go much further than that. That's not, that is a, is a worrying factor of the 21st century across the world that the environment is being reduced to a consumption choice or a corporate choice. It is a consumption choice. There should be good corporate choice. I'm not saying there isn't, but that's only a very small part of the issue. There's a much larger 
question which is much more intractable and therefore which requires the finest minds, heart, souls to apply ourselves to it. And if I can just add, because I know you, uh, you were also asking about environmental movements. I think this is the paradox that Mahesh points to. So, for instance, we all want trees to be protected on roads, but we want to our traffic to move faster. And so, if we want both of these things, it's not going to happen. So, but yeah, very nice to see all these great questions. And I think for us, it's a real vindication of the need for this Let's Talk Climate Change series. Please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. Srinivas. Um, so, Mr. Mahesh, you raised a point about uh, Montreal Protocol and the current climate change, uh, both being international treaties or agreements. Uh, I have been a part of the Montreal Protocol itself during uh, some years. Now, the phase out of Montreal Protocol was more focused and uh, it, it became a greater success. But currently, the climate uh, targets that are intended are not going in the right direction. And uh, we are still stuck and uh, we are still debating about the $100 billion which is supposed to come to the developing countries. But uh, the developed countries are now taking a new argument that um, India and China are no longer the so-called developing countries. So my question is, one, uh, <clears throat> is the decline of economic growth in the West uh, creating a new problem for the lack of climate negotiations to go ahead? And two, is what is the role of international politics uh, in delaying uh, the climate targets? Talk. I felt like it was reading 10 or 20 books at one time. Uh, I'm just trying to join the dots on a few things Can you, you introduce yourself also? Yeah, my name is Sabina, and I'm just trying to join the dots on a few uh, things you mentioned. Uh, very interesting. You mentioned things like, you know, the opium and the cotton and things moving zigzag because of uh, the British Empire and coal powering that. And then you mentioned the U.S. phenomena fired by oil. And then, you know, all of the bananas and the cocoa and all of that stuff moving zigzag, etc. And today, as we stand, uh, there's another revolution. And we, uh, as India, are also very much part of it. It's the IT revolution and data moving zigzag here and there. And we talk about, uh, we, we also hear about data being the next oil, you know, and AI algorithms uh, powering and firing our decisions, uh, even in farming and things like that, to the extent where a lot of accuracy is possible in terms of whether it's predicting disasters or predict predicting soil fertility, rainfall, etc. So I was very curious to know what are some of the intersecting trends uh, top of your mind, and I don't mean from solutioning, but from that very, uh, you know, it's one thing to say that, you know, people will all come together, the big, uh, you know, the bodies will come together for uh, the common humanity. But probably even if that doesn't happen, a close second might be these tipping, nudging points where we can get countries together for enlightened self-interest, you know, just propagating their growth and their vested interests. Uh, so I'm just very curious to know what are the top trends on your mind? I mean, some of the things going through my mind might be like probably things like you I know, have what to I ask mentioned. you to wind up because we have yeah, two more sure. questions. Yeah, sure. I'm just going to give like one or two cues uh, on that. Like uh, like I mentioned, the, the data pools and the algorithms, segueing with things like geospatial data. And now we have like these pocket Google Earths in our own pockets where we know what's happening in our terrain or we could know. Uh, along with things like new economies, like circular economies and donut economies, and even potentially MSMEs being the front runners to global conglomerates. And finally, this one thing on the experience economy, which we are all a part of now with the metaverse, taking over in a beautiful way in some way, uh, material consumption, you know, us getting satiated with experiences over actual material consumption of goods. So I'm just very curious to know a few trends intersecting in, in your mind. So Dr. Srinivas, you're absolutely correct. You see, where there is one focus, uh, the spread of nuclear weapons, the particular chemical compounds which depleted the ozone layer. I would add a third, the partial nuclear test plan treaty of 1963, in the signing of which this country was to play a very, very important role. And the test plan treaty was really what we would today call environmental concern was not about the countries which did the tests. It was that the consequences of the test, the Strontium 90, KSM 37, were lodged in the bone marrow of every man, woman, and child on earth. It was even found in, you know, seals and penguins and such creatures. 
And in 63, the Soviet Union, United States, and several countries came together. Eventually, the French and the Chinese also joined. But the broader the issue, the more difficult it is to get an agreement. There's a parallel, which is not a nice one, but I'm going to say it. You see, in the same period that this 87% decline of the nuclear weapons took place, conventional arms sales continue to grow. All the wars you read about, don't look at who's killing whom. Please ask who's making the weapons. And is it a coincidence that the five countries which are the biggest weapons producers are among the richest on earth? You know, it's not a secret, but I'm going to tell you, it's cheaper to give those weapons away than to destroy them. And when you look at the great wars on the earth, please look at where they are happening. Five million people have been killed, injured, or displaced in the Congo, which is one of the greatest repositories of mineral resources on the planet. That's one reason Belgium colonized it. It was the property of one man. You know, I, Prince Leopold owned Belgium in the words of Stanley, the way Stanley owned his dog or his chair. What an awful thing to say. But that place is a killing field. You hardly read about it. It's because of the minerals and the, you know, the, the enormous wealth beneath the land. It's not a coincidence that West Asia is such a major flashpoint of tension. It not only has oil, Indians should know that uh, some of the finest potash deposits on earth are in Syria, Libya, and Morocco. These are very important countries to India. By the way, so is Russia and China for the potash. And uh, it's not only decline of growth in the West. Sir. I think that the clout of the United States and the NATO members or the EC, that North American Transatlantic Alliance in the world, in economic terms, has declined. The, the transformation of the Chinese economy, to some extent, also I would add the Indian economy, the significance of Brazil, South uh, Africa, Indonesia, a clutch of countries, has transformed world economic relations, not massively, but substantially now. So the US today accounts for 20 to 25% of the gross world product. It is still the dominant power in the financial market. But please note, when you look at food, what you eat, fuel, what you burn, fertilizer, what you use to fertilize the crop, Russia and Ukraine are very critical. Ma'am, you talked about this knowledge economy. The knowledge economy to a large extent is based on the cell phone. Where does cobalt come from? It comes from a very small number of African countries. A lot of the rare earth minerals are largely from one country, which controls it, China. So we should not, we cannot divorce ourselves from the biosphere. We still need the oxygen and water and all the things that you know, are vital to make the life. We no, nor can we divorce ourselves from the flow of materials. You know, we have to rethink the way material science imagines its relationship with the biosphere. And here there's a problem. I was very struck when you were saying it, and it didn't occur to me. When we look at commodity history, we look at opium, cotton, tea, oil. But is one of the problems that we are thinking of carbon simply as a commodity, or carbon dioxide and fellow greenhouse gases simply as products? Is this not a somewhat reductionist way of thinking? Well, much as I appreciate this 280 parts per million, 400, that's simply a wake-up call. That's simply a sign. It's like, you know, the temperature of your body rising. That is not the problem. The problem is, you know, what we say, no? Dr. Ko Bulao. And you know, in the old films, I, I have to share this. For some reason, I've been watching 60s, 70s films looking for mentions of animals. It occurs to me in all the films, the person who has fever is trapped in blankets, which I'm told is the worst thing to do. And the doctor normally says, I injection, de diya, sab ho Answer to all problems is injection. Surely it isn't. And you know, this is a racket in India. Similarly, is the answer to the carbon issue simply commoditizing carbon? or simply working out how to reduce the carbon in the atmosphere. That's why there's a huge increase in uh, uh, technologies of sequestration. So my submission is, it's not only about the, of, uh, you know, the new economies. We haven't escaped the old economy. Nor the, we haven't escaped the agroecological, which is what is a short phrase for the life cycles. And we haven't escaped the materials economy. Those problems ain't going away nowhere. And if you're interested, there's a remarkable book by Asa Doron and Jeffrey on waste. And that's why my figure came from 80-fold growth. It's, un it's unbelievable, the transformation in India and Asian societies of the amount of waste being created. Your other question was environmental movements. I want to come back to what Professor Nagendra said. What is a movement? Whatever a movement is, a movement has to change the way we think about ourselves, about each other, about institutions, 
about society, about state, other states, the state of the world. And the great movements, just to cite one, the women's movement. One of the great contributions of women movement, women's movement is, it has made things which were major demands seem commonplace. Maternity leave. I keep coming back to this. It was not there. It's still not there in a lot of professions. Where there's a large unorganized sector, it doesn't exist. Childcare doesn't exist. How does the environment become like that? That's our real question. So this is, there's no easy answer to this. And one possible way to look at it is, if we look at, you know, I don't know how many of you are part of the new economy and how many of you are from firms which had what was called the eight-hour workday. You know, the eight-hour workday. The origins of the eight-hour workday were health of the human body and work conditions in the workplace. Broadly defined, this was an inclusive notion of the environment. The idea of making a certain disease notifiable because you fell ill at the workplace. Think of a very deadly disease in coal mines, pneumoconiosis. You know, you got this growth in your lungs and you died. From the 1920s, 1923 to be precise, to 77 or 76, there was movements of coal workers in this country to get this made a notifiable disease. I.e. if I have pneumoconiosis, I go off the rolls, but the company pays for my treatment till I die. It took 50 years. This issue has to, I'm not saying that's the model, but that's the kind of integration into lives that has to happen. And it's very difficult. It's complicated. It's not like saying, pay me more money, give me more leave. That's very easy, you know. I get, you give. Here, who's going to give? Who's going to get? What are its implications for the life cycle of, you know, the organisms? What is its implication for material flows? We need to unify these. And it, it, is, it is going to call for very new ways of thinking. And we may draw on Bookchin and all these great pioneers in that. Thanks. So, two more, last two questions. If yeah, we'll take them one after. Uh, hi, Raghav Desai. Uh, slightly cheekier. But, uh, so, the, you touched upon this at the end of your talk. You said that uh, the core, there's, there's a strong correlation between the average energy consumption and the average per capita income. But that correlation seems weaker than ever right now. Uh, in the US, there's been like a stagnation of how much per capita energy is consumed, uh, despite having economic growth. Uh, do you think the whole debate between the countries that the have and the have not countries between fighting climate change is a little misguided because we made uh, amazing efficiency gains via technology over the last few years? And it would be possible to alleviate large swaths of the world out of like poverty and, and give them the lifestyle that Western countries enjoy without having a large footprint on the environment. Can I ask a question? I asked permission to ask the audience questions. I was told I shouldn't do it during my talk. Uh, just think carefully and think. Sure. Car, cell phone, right. fridge, microwave, name something else. Washing machine. Have you seen these? Yeah. Can you name the country where these are made from? I mean, car? No, name the country. Car. The ma primarily manufactured. No, no, no. Name the country. Car. Name any country. Uh, they manufactured in India, for example. No, no, no. I want to know the company, not where it's oh, manufactured. Fair enough. China, US. US. It's you're not driving a Chinese car. Which car do you have? No, I don't have a car. Oh, who? Name a car. Yeah, fair enough. US, Ford. Germany. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. So I'll put it to you, the chances are these products are made. I've done this to my class, so I'm happy to share it with you. The chances are these are Korean, Japanese, German, American, and even now Dutch. Philips hasn't gone away. Yeah. It may be Korean. So actually this technology is not accessible to all. You've got to pay money for it, the product. They're not going to share the technology, they're only going to share the product. And you've got to pay money for it. Please be very clear. So. Technology can be a leveler, but for that access to the technology, this technology is owned by those companies. The President of the United States, Prime Minister of Great Britain, even our new friend there, they can't tell the company what to do. The company will tell them to go jump into the Atlantic or whatever. Even in China, I'm not sure that the all-powerful General Secretary, President of China, can tell the Chinese corporation, do you know the largest GMO company on earth, is not an American company. It's not Dutch, it's Chinese. Uh, it, he can't tell them to share their technology. They may share their product. So I'm not sure that's an answer in itself. We still have to ask a question. Fair enough. You know, so we can't get away from that. I don't know the answer to this. So I'm happy to pose the question. No, fair enough. Uh, but just to push back on that a little bit. Last, yeah. I think last week, Foxconn, which is the largest uh, manufacturer of uh, elect consumer electronics, yeah. uh, came out with their own model car. 
Yeah. And they claim that like the next set of cars would come from countries like India and China because there's like a significant shift. And this is specific to cars because it's shifting from ICE to electric and suddenly the technology is much simpler. Uh, one, like there's democratized on the car level happening anyway. Uh, therefore, I don't think the technology transfer needs to happen as abruptly as you put it. No, 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 no. No transfer is happening. Right. Look, let's be very clear. I'm sorry to say this. Civilian airliners. How many people in this... Uh, 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 audience have ridden, have taken a flight in a in a in an aircraft, right? What aircraft were you riding? Tell me the name. Boeing, Good. Where is Boeing's headquarters? US. Seattle, US. right? And which is the other aircraft? Yeah, uh, France. There you are. Yes, the Russians have their their aircraft. You know the Antonov. Okay, and the Chinese are building one. That's it. That's it. A modern aerospace. That's modern technology. To build a civilian airliner means you're an industrial nation of the modern variety. Second question. Cars. Which are the large automobile manufacturers on earth? North America. Sorry. Yeah. Germany. South Korea. China. Well, actually, United States still. It's still there. France. Largely old industrial powers and couple of recent Asian countries. So the technology is not, your other point I completely agree with. Energy consumption, in fact, material consumption, not only energy, all of these, I would argue many European countries, for all the things I said about them, the Scandinavian countries particularly, have shown you can have better quality of life, but they are countries with very strong public action. For instance, to give you a very interesting instance, in the 70s, one of the responses to the energy crisis of the developed countries, which to me is very interesting, was the French. Those who are interested, a remarkable book by Michael Best called The Light Green Society. You'll feel really good because nowadays much of the news coming from France is not at all good for a variety of other reasons. Uh, but uh, this book shows that in the 70s, the French decided on three things. First, they were going to save energy on transport. They put enormous amount of money on a fantastic high-speed high, high speed rail network, which is heavily subsidized. But this has brought down the use of cars. So the amount of French men and women jumping onto these trains and jumping off them is huge. The other, many people here may not agree, I have my reservations also, is to invest heavily in nuclear energy. 70% of the power is nuclear. Now both of these were driven by French nationalism. They wanted to show they were different from the Americans. That's why they subsidize French films, which are much better, but very few people see them. Still, Hollywood is still Hollywood. Now, this is a very particular kind of response. But the French could do it. They are one of the original industrial powers. They're still there. They ain't gone nowhere. They're not gone anywhere. So I am not so sure. You see, when we look at the 50-odd countries of the African Union, most Asian countries, see, we tend to think of the countries of West Asia as very rich. Actually, in terms of technological progress, most of them are not. They don't own their technologies. All the oil drilling equipment is is from somewhere else. So we have to come to terms with the fact that one of the consequences of the Industrial Revolution is technological know-how is not evenly distributed. Breaking through in new production cycles for a new player is very difficult. Remember the Soviet Union tried it. That's one of the reasons they won the Second World War. You see that tanks were bigger, faster and better than anything the Germans built. They built them pretty fast. The China story is even more remarkable. In 1990, China, India roughly had the same per capita income. Roughly. Roughly. Today, the GDP is six times as much. And we all know that they've emerged initially as a major place where assembly was done. Made in China. Made in China, but designed in America. Or Japan. Or, you know, France. That has changed. Now, how far has it broken through into producer goods? We don't know. That we'll have to see. Can India do that? Maybe. But are these going to be equally shared? You really think so? I leave it to you. It's not like fire. You see, the first person who made, no, it's very important. See, 1.8, 2 million years ago, there's a big change. Humans or hominids managed to use fire for cooking and heating. It's a remarkable innovation. I think one of the most incredible transformations. Now, the wonderful thing about fire is you could learn very quickly how to make it and you'd better learn how to control it. This isn't as simple. It's much more complicated. The technology for this mic is not recently not Indian. It's on license from the manufacturer. I'll later find out which mic it is. I'm always struck when you look at Indian national movement photos. I don't know how many of you look at it carefully. It says Radio Chicago. As a kid, I thought it's the, some radio station in Chicago. I later learned the name of the company. It's very important. These are very powerful entities and they're not going to share it because that's their secret. So. And the last question. Yeah. Hi, my name is Shravan. Uh, one of the best uh, speeches I've heard in climate change. Thank you. 
So my question is, are we fooling ourselves with uh, electric mobility? So if most of our uh, electricity is produced using fossil fuels, uh, why are we trying to uh, you know, push on electric mobility, which effectively has higher carbon emissions, as well as um, also like, you know, the material damage that's happening, you know, like with the batteries and stuff. So one of my former bosses, who shall remain nameless, deeply committed to the environment, said, I'm so happy you're teaching. I said, thank you. You have left us in the world of media. You are educating the new generation. You know what? One of your students should be the next Elon Musk. And I said, oh God, but why? Do we need another Elon Musk? I thought one was enough. You know, there's a very interesting article on Tesla, which came in Scientific American last year, written by Chirag Dhara, who's a very brilliant climate change modeler. And he's in Kriya University. And Professor Vandana Singh, who's in Framington University. And it takes this Tesla car apart. So the Tesla car, the electric car, uses very little energy per mile. Great. They then show the materials used to make the Tesla car. They are they're both physicists originally. These are far more damaging than materials used to make a normal car. So we need to take a holistic view of this. I completely agree. My sense is it's being driven by two possibilities. One, the idea that you'll reduce emissions in the cities, laudable aim. Second, that certain manufacturers will produce, produce this new technology and say, hey, we solved the problem. But what is the problem? And to go back, you know, there's this very old book, which I can't remember the name of, but I'll share that quote, you know, where somebody is dying and he says, uh, uh, Gertrude, Gertrude, what is the answer? And this person says, Alice, Alice, what is the question? They were referring to something very profound, meaning of life. But what is the question? I think the idea of the Anthropocene, by the way, I have deep reservations about this idea. Uh, we can go back and say the Anthropocene, should, should it be dated to the beginning of the Holocene and agriculture? Should it be animal domestication, etc., etc.? But the idea that the human environmental footprint is so deep in its consequences, intended and unintended, for ourselves, for our safety, our livability, for the environment to be habitable and for it to be biologically productive. I'm putting all four. Safety, livability, productivity. That needs to be looked at. And these answers, this product will solve it. You know, I don't know if you've thought about it. There, were, there are these remarkable products. You, you'll know why I know about these products, which are the cure to baldness. Do you have any idea how large that market is? It's in billions of dollars. There are actually people who believe this is the answer. Now, is it the answer? We all laugh at these guys. But here we are embracing this. Not India, across the world. How can it possibly be an answer? There's something much simpler. It's so simple. There's a brilliant article by Charles Correa. Charles Correa says, Bombay got it right. What did Bombay get right? He says, just look at the design of the Bombay urban railway system. During the early 20th century, you see, they built the railway system, they built the workers' flats all around. This is done by an imperial state, which wanted the wages to be held low. But at least they built such a good... And he then asked, why did independent India not extend those railway lines inside? Instead, they went and built Navi Bombay, which of course, he was involved in designing, so he loves it. So I think that public transport would be one simple answer. But it requires heavy capital investment. Public transport that is affordable. In fact, public transport, if it were to be subsidized, would in the longer term produce so much public good that it would cancel out whatever the costs were, but someone has to take on the costs. Similarly, I don't know if you thought about it, uh, there's a very interesting scholar in Shiv Nadar, uh, Kannan, forgetting her first name, Vidya Kannan. She's writing a book on the bicycle. And what happened to the bicycle in India? Have you ever thought about it? It disappeared in the last 50 years. It's unsafe to ride a bicycle. You'll be knocked down and killed. Why? And so, between these two forms of transport which are not polluting, such as the bicycle, and good public transport, that would be an answer. This is, I mean, all, all power to Mr. Elon Musk and his other crackpot ideas. But, you know, I, I really think that if we think the answer is a new commodity, a new product, we're fooling ourselves. Now, if someone, people want to fool themselves, they're welcome to do so. But we should not hesitate to ask these questions because the consequences of these are very serious. You're, you're seeing it around it. You know, one of the questions I ask my political science friends, I, they don't have an answer either, is 
how can we have a city where 15 20% of the children children and old people are in see if a child is ill all of us will be very concerned whoever's child it is old person will be concerned. and it's clear that many of these illnesses are to do with air pollution and it's not a major public issue why i don't know i don't have the answer and and that i think should worry us more than you know embracing these marvelous you know push button solutions the push button solutions were the problem that's why racial caste matters thank you thank you thank you so much i think this i think we are 15 minutes beyond time but we could e easily have gone on for a couple of hours because i'm sure there's many people who wanted to ask questions but uh, please the, well, first of all, a big thank you to Professor Angarajan. I think this was the best possible introduction to our climate talk series, uh, Let's Talk Climate Change series. I think this also, in, I mean, the, the wide-ranging discussions to me really tell us why we need talk series like this. And so for anyone who's listening in another city, please start your own Let's Talk Climate Change series. I think we need hundreds of these across India in cities, in villages, in small towns, looking at uh, it from the historical point of view, the technological point of view, the economic point of view, and, and bringing all the pieces together. So we hope to have more of these. And I think Mahesh's was, there's a word in, Can in Canada called boni, which is the first in the lucky start. And I think Mahesh has been the best boni for us. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.